a wee bit embarrassed after what Stuart said, and I have to say that it's not too difficult being a person in the UK that knows most about cosmic rays, because not many people work on cosmic rays anymore, sadly, in the UK. And certainly if my friend Arnold Wolfendale, who is uh, 11 years older than me, was here, I think he would challenge your statement, because Arnold's still publishing uh, on cosmic rays. I work on extremely high-energy cosmic rays on a project called the Osi Observatory, which is in southern Argent western Argentina. We're looking for cosmic rays, which are very, very rare, which hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere about 10 per minute. And they have a kinetic energy, which is roughly the same as the kinetic energy of the tennis ball in Andy Murray's first serve. And we're trying to measure them. And that's what I spent about 50 years doing, which is a bit embarrassing. But over the years, I have picked up a little bit about cosmic rays generally, and I'll try and tell you some numbers that are relevant to the discussions that we're going to have. First of all, when you're lying in bed at night, about a million charged particles go through your body. And these are what you should really call secondary cosmic rays. They're not the cosmic rays that come in at the top of the atmosphere. They're the transformations that uh, Stuart showed in his slide. The dose that you get is about nothing to worry about. It's about two x-ray uh, per year, something like that, if you have a chest x-ray or something. That's the kind of dose you get twice a year. I said that at a talk I gave uh, some years ago, and at the end, there was this, um, it was a public lecture, there was this young lad about 10, I think. He said he was actually really very worried about this, and I absolutely upset him, but I'm just assuring you there's nothing really to worry about. They're going through your body all the time. Probably some of them cause uh, genetic changes, but nothing to worry about. Nothing you can do about them anyway. <laughs> now, at sea level, the total flux of cosmic rays crossing a horizontal area from above is about 180 per square meter per second. When I started as a research student many years ago in Edinburgh, the numbers that we were given were 0.01 per square meter per square centimeter per second or one per square centimetre per minute. You see those numbers don't exactly agree, and that's because it's a very rough number, just to give you a feel for what's involved. And the important thing for the topic that we're discussing is that only about a third of the particles are electrons or positrons. Positrons are the positive version of the electron. The other particles, by and large, are muons, which have much higher energies and which are therefore not very easy to bend, and it's quite difficult to tell in a simple piece of apparatus, which we would need to think of building, it would be quite difficult to bend them, and probably they wouldn't be changed by the phenomenon that Stuart described. So we need to focus really on the electrons and the positrons. But there's quite a lot of them about, about 50 per square meter per second, 50 hertz and up there. Now the muons arise high in the atmosphere, they actually come from the decay of things called positive pions, and most of the electrons come from the decay of these muons in flight, or from electrons are knocked out of nuclei, are knocked out of atoms by the muons. The photons come from the decay of neutral pions. The pion up in the top right-hand corner there comes in three forms, and the neutral ones decay, they give you gamma rays, and also you get a process called Bremsstrahlung, where a charged particle is accelerated as it goes past the nucleus and it radiates photons. Now the energies of the muons typically are above about 250 MeV. So they're, in terms of being bent by a magnetic field, they're not bent very much. And this depends quite strongly on altitude, which of course is relevant in the context of earthquake detection because sometimes earthquakes are, for example, in L'Aquila, in Italy, it's relatively high. Now, it turns out that there's not all that much known about the electron and photon energies because they're quite hard to measure. And it's never actually been a subject that's been of great intrinsic interest. I'll show you such measurements as there are, but they all date back to the order of 40, 50 years. But the typical energies corresponding to the fluxes I talked about, sort of 50 per square, cent per square meter per second, have energies about 10 MeV, which is a pretty low energy. It's sort of similar to the energy that you 
a electron coming from a radioactive source would have, a little bit higher than that. But there's probably lower energy electrons about. They're quite difficult to measure because they get scattered a lot, so it's not easy to control what you're looking at. It's a pretty steep spectrum, and you only get uh, about five above 100 MeV compared with the 50 that I talked about. So the low energy electrons, similar to radioactive sources, that's what we would be trying to look at. And when I say electron, I also mean positron, because as far as the cosmic rays are concerned, they don't care really whether they're positive or negative. Now these are the ancient, ancient papers that I dug out. One is actually 1955. I'd, uh, I just started at university. Uh, no, I, hadn't even, I was just finishing my, my hires. I'm a Scot, as you may have picked up. I was just <laughs> finishing my hires uh, in, in Edinburgh then, in 1955. And this paper was 1968, when I'd, I'd moved to Leeds and I was just starting to do research. The one on the left shows the energy distribution of electrons, which is really uh, confirming what I've said. It goes down to about 5 MeV, and you see it's a fairly flat spectrum, and then it steepens. And the one on the left shows the energy spectrum at a high mountain, the Zugspitze in Germany, measured, reported in 1968. The, the lower curve are for the electrons, and above that are the photons. You, you usually get more photons because they're not so easily absorbed, they don't ionize the way electrons do. So they're usually more photons, but not vastly more. And I don't actually really think that's going to be uh, of interest to us, nor do I think it's going to be a serious background problem. Now just to give you an idea of the kind of apparatus, the scale of the apparatus you might have to think about, uh, this is what was used for that 1968 measurement. And it's a stack of different counters, I won't discuss this, it's not relevant really, but it's about a meter high and about the order of 20 centimeters or so across. So it's a, it's a pretty big thing. And clearly we need to try and miniaturize that, but I don't think that is, is a huge problem with modern technology. Now, the muons in particular are affected by temperature and by pressure. Again, uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. With the pressure, you can just think if there's more air there, the particles ionize more, so you, some of them disappear. And all cosmic ray, low energy cosmic ray particles follow the 11 year variation of the sun. The sun, as you possibly know, has sunspots and they change with an 11 year cycle. It's actually a 22 year old cycle, 22 year cycle, but uh, that's a technicality you need to worry about. But it's an 11 year variation. And that changes the magnetic field that is associated with the sun, which prevents the cosmic rays coming in if the field is strong. That's the cosmic rays coming from outside our galaxy. Now, interestingly, there is an excess of about 20% of positive muons, and that arises because of the cosmic rays being positively charged, and even if you've got uh, nuclei, you're going to have more protons than, than neutrons in some of the elements. But if you see proton plus proton, that can produce a pi zero, that's a neutral particle, that produces the photons, or a proton plus a neutron, because you get what's called a charge exchange, one of the protons becomes a neutron, and you get a pi plus. There isn't a process that gives you a pi minus, so this gives you an excess of positive muons. Now you also get an excess of electrons, negative electrons, because of the annihilation of the positrons, the positive electrons, and also because of the Compton effect. The Compton effect is when a photon loses energy and gives energy to an electron. Now, the ratio is actually quite poorly known at sea level, really because it's not actually of great intrinsic interest from the point of view of trying to find out things about the astrophysics of cosmic rays. But the estimates are about 10 to 20 percent. And I found, I'm ashamed to say, only late yesterday, this table of Kay and Levy, which gives the cosmic ray fluxes near sea level. And you see it gives electrons uh, in the fourth column fourth column in, and it says as a footnote, 40 to 50% are positrons, about 0.1 GeV, but only 5% at 1 MeV. So the figure of 20, I haven't had a chance to check out where those numbers come from. Now, that is quite an important number because if I understand the mechanism that Stuart is advocating correctly, we would want to look to see how the fraction of positrons changes, or what the ratio between positive uh, how, how the increase is of, of the electrons because of the acceleration of the electrons. So we want to see 
what was going on there. The electrons are going to get accelerated uh, in a different way from the positrons. So, so that's an interesting number to know. Now, to separate the electrons from the magnetic field, with the magnetic field, uh, you need some sort of tracking system. And in the note, the long, dense note that Stuart didn't let me read, it actually said this was an exercise for Becky's students to do, I think, if I remember correctly. But basically, the magic formula is that B, the magnetic field, times the radius of curvature of the bending of the particle in the magnetic field is equal to the mass of the particle multiplied by its speed and divided by its charge. And the important number for us is that the product BR is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla meters. I never work in tesla, but I think I've got that right. Now, there's a nice recent example in two projects. One is the uh, a satellite called Pamela, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. Another one is a project called AMS, which is a project on the International Space Station. And they're actually measuring positrons and electrons to very, very high accuracy. But the targets are much, the energies are much higher than the energies we're interested in. They're sort of GEV, that kind of energy. We're interested in much lower energy. But I think it's relevant to see what they do. Now, I wanted to show this because it's a, it's a historic cloud chamber picture which was made by Blackett and Occhialini in the 1930s. And you see these curved tracks, which are the tracks of particles in a cloud chamber. The cloud chamber was probably about the diameter of this microphone. And the magnetic field was about two tesla. And you see there are some bent to the right and some bent to the left. Some of those are positively charged particles, positrons, the other ones are negatively charged particles, electrons. And essentially, to do what Stuart wants you to do, you have to devise a piece of equipment which will allow you to make measurements with high statistics of the positive and negative particles in the cosmic ray beam. Now, you certainly can't do it with a cloud chamber where the number of exposures you would get would be maybe, uh, if you had it working very well, one a minute, something like that. You have to have some sort of electronic method. Now, the Pamela satellite, which has been flying for quite a long time, has used uh, um, magnets, not a, not a, mag a magnetic field coming from, uh, from, I guess, artificial permanent magnets. And these are arranged, you see the scale of that is about 24 centimeters across the particles go perpendicular to that magnetic field shown by the B there. And these are stacked together to give a, an apparatus which allows them to make measurements. Now this is actually probably from a picture taken when they were doing some accelerated measurements. So the particles come in from the left. And each of those five segments correspond to the magnetic field. So the magnetic field going into the, into the board. And then the vertical lines are the so-called tracking system, which are, are, are really silicon detectors. And with that, they're able to measure the trajectory of the positive and negative particles. There's the protons and antiprotons, but it worked just as well for electrons and uh, positrons, anti-electrons, if you like. And the scale of that is, is the 20-odd centimeters that I talked about. That's what it looks like all stacked up. And my final slide is just showing you how the way these things vary with altitude for actually quite high energies about the GEV. So that's a little bit of background to help you uh, with the design of this detector. Thank you.